Part 4 Exodus 28 As it turned out, they weren't ready to leave until well past midday. There had been some toing and froing over whether they should take the carts. In the end, Diana had overruled them. The carts are already loaded, and with the horses pulling them, we'll be able to move just as quick with or without them. So I say we take them. At least then we're not going to your people empty-handed. That's final. Okay, okay, honestly. They wouldn't mind, but you're the boss. He had a thought. Hey, maybe we can sit the smaller kids on them. It might even mean we go faster. There you go, said Diana, smiling and shaking her head at the time they had wasted arguing over it. Now, if you'd just listened in the first place, he laughed. There was a buzz of excitement in the town, and it had infected them both. He didn't want to think about his homecoming, not yet. There were a lot of miles to tread, not to mention the Brotherhood probably being hot on their tails. How long before they came back? Given that the two brothers were on foot and they would need time to gather a force and travel back, he was pretty sure they would arrive sometime tomorrow afternoon. It could be quicker, though and he wanted to put as many miles between them and Williton Green as possible before nightfall. By the time the horses were hooked up to the carts, nearly everybody had gathered and lined up on the road by the fire. They had been told to bring only what they could carry comfortably, and for the most part had done that. Do you think they'll come after us when they see we've gone? He asked Diana, as she headed to her house to grab her own backpack. Yes, she said, without a shred of hesitation. There will be a lot of them and they'll have that damned truck of theirs, and guns. I thought they'd sworn off guns, but I remember you saying they used them when they killed Stephen. Well, they seem to pick and choose when that rule applies. Usually they use them when they've been defied. They'll bring them this time. You can take that to the bank. More concerning to Luke than the guns at this point was the fact they would have the truck. Even with twenty-four hours' start, the Brotherhood would catch them before they got anywhere near safety. You look worried, said Diana, as they stepped inside her house for the last time. I am. Listen, I know there is no vehicle, but is there a bicycle in town, one that works? Sure, a couple. Tommy has... She paused and took a deep breath. Had one. It's out back. Why? Insurance, he said. I'll explain as we're leaving. Diana watched him head purposefully for the back door and shrugged. Samuel, it's time to go, she called. When she headed back outside with Samuel in tow and a small backpack over her shoulder, Diana found Luke at the front of the column talking to Jacob and pointing to a dog-eared map. The teenager was sitting on Tommy's BMX bike with his bow slung over his shoulder. What's going on? she asked. I'm going to ride on ahead and get help in case we need it, said Jacob, clearly proud of the responsibility Luke had bestowed upon him. No, it's too dangerous. What? Please, Diana, Luke said... Before she could answer, Luke took her by the elbow and led her away from the group. Sorry I didn't clear it with you before, but we need this. At best, we're going to have 24 hours start on the Brotherhood. With their truck, they'll catch us before we get anywhere near Manchester. I want to send Jacob on ahead so he can get us back up. Isaac will come. I know he will. Diana looked unsure. Look, said Luke, it's a long shot, but we have to try it. Otherwise, we may as well just stay here. Fine, she said, still not happy but understanding the need. She went over to Jacob. Have you got water? Yes, ma'am, he said, and patted the Hessian bag on his handlebar. And bread. I'll be fine. Can I go? Diana put her arm around him and kissed his cheek. The kid blushed. Go on. Ride as fast as you can, but be careful and rest when you need to, okay? It's your thing, Di, he said, looking the happiest she'd seen him since Tommy had died. Okay, kid, go. Remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint, and don't lose the map. Jacob gave a wave and took off like a rocket. A road bike would have been better, said Luke as they watched him ride off. But it'll do the trick. Diana looked worried as he disappeared through the gate at the end of the road. Luke put his arm around her shoulders. Does he know where to go? Yep, I showed him the exact roads we'll be taking. He'll be fine. He wished he was as certain of that as he tried to sound. Ten minutes after Jacob had cycled away, 
Diana did a rough head count as Luke lifted the three kids under the age of five onto the laden carts. They squealed in delight as their mothers clucked and worried beside the carts. Okay, that's everyone, said Kathy, coming up beside her. Diana turned to the column of thirty-four souls that were her people. Let's roll, she called and grabbed the reins of the horse she would be leading and gave it a gentle tug. Samuel sat on a bareback, carrying the shotgun. The Glock was in Diana's belt, and she had spare shells for the shotgun in her jacket pockets. Two guns. One handgun and one shotgun. He wondered how many they would face if, when, the Brotherhood caught them. Luke grabbed the other horse's rope and clicked his tongue. The people of Williton Green set off for their new life with the sun high overhead. 29. The two guards on duty on the steps of the Brotherhood's headquarters gripped their staffs and came forward as a limping figure approached along what used to be known as Congress Street. In its previous life, the impressive building had been City Hall. Now it was the center of the Brotherhood's world. Senior Brother Jared! There could be no doubt it was the senior brother. His hawkish features were unmistakable, even with his face covered in blood. Jared held out a weak hand, then promptly fell to the ground. The guards rushed forward to help the injured man to his feet. "'Bless you, brothers,' he said weakly, as they each put a shoulder under his arms and walked him up the steps and into the main hall. Jared let his head slump, pleased his ruse had worked. A self-inflicted cut on the scalp and some method acting was all it took, and Jared, the wounded warrior monk, had returned." The two guards called for help, and soon there was a gaggle of clucking brothers around him. "'Let him breathe!' called a senior brother, pushing through and followed by a fresh-faced novice. The others scattered, lest they be knocked aside by the sheer girth of senior brother Rex. He knelt next to Jared with an agility that belied his size and lifted Jared's chin with his rough fingers. "'Jared, what happened?' Jared kept up his act. He knew it needed to be good to fool Rex. Undisciplined with his eating, he might be, but the big man was dangerously smart. Breathlessly, Jared told of the unprovoked attack by the people of Williton Green and the red-haired outlaw. All dead? Jared nodded, allowing tears to spring to his eyes. I barely escaped with my life, but not before staving a head or two. Brother Taylor fought bravely to the end, imploring me to save myself and bring God's justice down upon the people of that town. It was his stand that allowed me to escape. He made the sign of the cross on his chest, and the men around him did the same. This was the same red-headed heathen that caused so much trouble in Old Orchard Beach? asked Senior Brother Rex. The very same, said Jared, holding up his hand with his index finger curled. Hook hand and all. Rex nodded. Take Brother Jarrett to his quarters. Wash and tend to his wounds. I must speak to the council. Ring the bell, Dennis. The wide-eyed young novice who had followed Brother Rex into the hall ran off and tugged a rope by the door. The bell pealed three times. Then the novice turned around and hurried after his master. Jared sat on the hard bench with the other senior brothers. He'd let Rex take the lead on telling his story, preferring to sit quietly, ever the stoic. He couldn't have pulled off the story as theatrically as the bigger man anyway. The faces of the three bishops on the council were equal parts rapt and outraged as senior brother Rex told them of the disastrous mission to Williton Green as passed on to him by Jared. I'm sure you'll agree this outrage must be met on the strongest terms, my good sirs, he ended. The three bishops, all dressed in white habits to set them apart from their brethren, put their heads together and conferred. Jared watched them, thoughtful. These three men governed the church as a triumvirate. Their terms were three years, with one bishop retiring and replaced each year, so there were always two experienced men on the council. 
Cranston's tenure would expire on Christmas Day later that very year. The council members were elected from their own number by the twenty senior brothers, and Jared planned to put his own name forward in the next ballot. Bishop Jared had a nice ring to it, and he planned to make the most of the opportunity if it came to him. Unfortunately, his chief rival would be the popular senior brother Rex. After less than a minute, the middle bishop, Cranston, stood up. Being the longest-serving member, Cranston was the spokesperson for the three. Jared hadn't voted for him three years before when he was new to the black robe himself, but the man seemed competent enough. Senior Brother Rex, we on the council agree. Swift justice will be meted out to these murderous ingrates. You will lead the attack party. Jared's jaw tightened. He had been expecting to lead the attack party. A successful mission would only be another feather in Rex's cap. He nearly interrupted, but decided it was smarter to let Cranston finish. Take the truck and twenty of our best men first thing in the morning. Leave none alive but the red-headed barbarian. He is to be brought back here and crucified in the town square of Old Orchard Beach. A lesson to those who helped him escape. There were small gasps from the men around him. A crucifixion? There hadn't been one in years. Jared had planned to deal with Captain Hook himself, but it would be just as satisfying watching the bastard nailed to a cross. Besides, he had other fish to fry, fish much bigger and closer to home. Yes, Bishop Cranston, said Rex smoothly. It shall be done. Guns? The bishop pursed his lips. Of course, he said, and quickly conferred with the other bishops. You may take four automatics. The other bishops stood, indicating the meeting was at an end, and the senior brothers around Jared also began to stand. Pardon, if I may, he called, pushing up next to Rex. The bishops paused and looked around. Yes, senior brother, asked Cranston. I'd like to go along, if you will it. I have some unfinished business with these people. Cranston's eyes locked onto his, then glanced at the bandage on his head. Are you not feeling the ill effects of your last encounter? It is but a scalp wound, sir. I will be fine after a night's rest. Senior Brother Rex? I have no objection, sir. Very well, then. But Rex is in command, do you understand? Yes, sir said Jared, seething that Cranston had spoken to him in such a way in front of the other senior brothers. We'll see about that. 30. Luke had advised Jacob to ride until just before sunset and then find a house to sleep in. He didn't say anything to Luke, but the thought of sleeping in an old abandoned house freaked him out. Besides, it was a reasonably balmy night, so he decided to stop and bed down in the trees beside a heavily wooded part of the 202 instead. His thighs felt heavy as he climbed off the bike and wheeled it into the trees. He pulled out his map and had some bread and the last of his water as he examined it. Just over the next rise, he would cross the border into New Hampshire and then hit the outer suburbs of East Rochester not long after. He would leave at first light and skirt the city as per Luke's instructions, then turn on to the 125. Just past the town called Epping, he would take a turn onto the 101, which would lead him all the way into Manchester. He estimated it would take him about two hours to ride from Rochester to Epping, then another hour and a bit to get to the outskirts of Manchester. That would put him there before midday. He folded the map and put it away as dusk fell. He was asleep within minutes. The rest of the group only made it half the distance Jacob did before Luke and Diana called them to a halt. There were whispers and sighs of relief right along the column. 
They veered off the 202 a little way and found a large two-story house to spend the night in. Luke had his doubts they would all fit comfortably, but most were so exhausted it wouldn't matter as long as they had enough floor space to lay down. Over a fire pit in the backyard, Diana and Kathy cooked a big pot of oats with blueberries that the kids had picked along the way mixed in. It was served with day-old bread, not exactly restaurant fare, but no one left a crumb on their plates. Diana called curfew about an hour after sunset. No one grumbled. Not even the older kids. Most bedded down for the night in the big living room and front hallway. Do you want the last bed, Luke? Diana asked. Three of the four beds in the house had been loaded with the smallest children and their mothers, and there was one left, a single in the only downstairs bedroom. No, you and Sam will take it, he said. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. I'll sleep by the front door. A few minutes later, after checking the locks on all the doors, Luke went to the front door and lowered himself onto the floor. He took off his leather jacket and used it as a pillow. He was willing to sacrifice warmth for a tiny bit of comfort. They ate the last of the bread, cooked oats, and some more berries for breakfast. Luke was anxious to get back on the road and hurried everybody out of the house while some were still eating. He knew every minute counted now. The chances were high that the Brotherhood would catch them. The only question was, would it be before or after Isaac and the rest found them? He didn't allow himself to consider that Jacob might fail in his mission. That didn't bear thinking about. They rejoined the Carl Brog Highway, the 202, and began the next leg of their journey. The 202 would take them to Rochester, New Hampshire, well before midday if they made good time. Luke's anxious mood matched the day. A floating blanket of mist covered the tops of the fall-colored trees that lined the highway, lending the morning a foreboding feel. Let's pick it up, he called, and tugged the reins of the horse he was leading a little harder. 31. It's just over that hill, said senior brother Jared, leading forward. He sat next to the passenger side window in the cab of the Mack truck. Next to him was senior brother Rex, and in the driver's seat, a younger member of their order, brother Michael. Very good. Hit the music, Brother Michael. Let them know we're coming for them. Yes, sir, said Michael, a solid young man of twenty-two. He reached up and flicked a small switch on the ceiling of the cab. The first bars of Flight of the Valkyrie always made the hairs on Jared's neck stand up. This occasion was no different. The music blared from the purpose-built bullhorn speakers welded to the top of the prime mover. There! Jared called as the sign to Williton Green came into view. Michael slowed, then turned the semi-trailer onto the small road. Now, on the straight, he pressed the gas hard and the Mack picked up speed. They barreled down the hill and through the small copse of trees that grew thick on either side of the road and burst out on the other side in a whirlwind of leaves. The rig was quite a sight. The cab was all white, with gold crosses embossed on the doors and a golden crucifix twelve inches high on the hood, where the famous Mac Bulldog should have been. The curtain sides of the trailer were also white, with Christ's chariot painted in big red letters down the side. Jared's fingers gripped the dashboard as the walls of the town came into view. Time to make these bastards pay. Stop the truck! ordered Rex over the loud Wagner composition. Brother Michael, who was already slowing the vehicle, brought it to a complete stop fifty feet from the open gates and switched the engine off. There was no movement beyond the gates, but for now their attention was taken by the four bodies strewn on either side of the opening anyway. Rex's mouth tightened as he silently weighed up what he was seeing. We'll get out here. We need to be careful of a trap, said Jared. If you'd taken more care on your earlier visit, perhaps we wouldn't need to, said Rex. This time it was Jared's mouth that tightened. He swallowed his anger and climbed out of the cab. Rex followed him and when he was on the ground turned back to Brother Michael. Stay behind the wheel 
and turn that infernal music off. They're clearly not here. The music ceased, and Rex stalked to the back of the truck. Jared followed. We can't be sure, he said. No, we can't, interrupted Rex as he turned the lever of the roller door and pulled it up with a clatter. The twenty men sitting on the long benches inside blinked in the sudden light. So we'll send in the gunman to confirm, while the rest of us start digging graves. The brothers piled out, and Rex instructed the four armed with assault rifles to carefully scour the town. Almost certainly the people of Willetton Green had fled. It was the only sensible thing to do. Best to be sure, though. An hour later, four freshly dug graves were filled in, each plot of turned soil marked with a plain white cross of wood. Would you like to do the honors? Rex asked Jared, his tone hard to read. Jared nodded and stepped forward. He said a short prayer over each of the four graves as the brothers echoed him. He turned to Rex when he was done. The other man nodded, his face expressionless. Let's have a quick look at this town before we track these heathens. The town was empty, the horses and carts brought by Jared and his men gone. Their tracker, Brother Simon, dug around the ashes with his right hand, then stood up. Cold. I'd say they have close to twenty-four hours start on us. He walked along the dust-covered roadway to the gates and spent five minutes examining the footprints and marks. At least thirty, along with two horses. And these marks here are the tire marks of the trailers. Brother Simon followed the trail out through the gates, and Jared turned to tail him, but was pulled to a stop when Rex grabbed his wrist in a claw-like grip. A word, Brother Jared? Jared secretly seethed at Rex's dropping of senior, but looked at him coolly. Yes... I wonder why there were only four bodies. Jared stomached at a somersault. I was wondering that myself, he said with a confused look. Where on earth could Brother Taylor's body be? I don't know, senior brother, he said, holding Rex's hawk-like gaze. All I know is I saw the big man open his throat with that damned hook of his. From the amount of blood, there's no way he could have survived. Jared shook his head and looked heavenward, apparently overcome with emotion. One hand held his staff, while the other slipped unnoticed into his pocket and gripped his knife. Senior Brother Rex watched him for a few seconds more, his face inscrutable, then turned and began walking. Yes, it certainly is a mystery, Perhaps we'll solve it together, hey? Jared followed him, sorely tempted to show the fat bastard exactly what had happened to Brother Taylor. Brother Simon was walking up the hill and through the cops by the time they reached the truck. The men were already back in the trailer and the two senior brothers climbed into the cab beside Brother Michael. Michael started the truck and turned it in a wide circle before following Brother Simon all the way back to the 202. Simon paused for a moment, looking at the ground and dust beside the road, before pointing west as they pulled up beside him. They've gone this way, he said. Brother Michael, I'll take over the driving. You take Brother Simon's place in the rear. I need him up here. Two minutes later, they were headed along the 202 at 20 miles an hour, Brother Simon running his finger along the map he'd brought along. Almost certainly they're headed to Rochester. I'll keep an eye out for signs of them along the way. Twenty minutes later, Brother Simon leaned forward abruptly. Pull over here, please, he said, pointing at a corner where a lane fed off the 202. The lane was lined with a few homes, each on about a half acre of land. He jumped out as soon as the truck had pulled over and began examining the dirt and gravel at the edges of the road. They were here! he called over his shoulder, before pointing at the ground on one side of the road. See, they turned this way and went down the lane. He ran to the other side. Then they came back the same way and turned west again. Why did they go down the lane? asked Jared from the cab. 
Simon didn't answer, just headed confidently down the shady lane towards the houses on the right. Let's follow him, said Rex, jumping out. Jared got out and walked with him. They followed Simon to the second house along. Simon did a cursory look around the house and then went into the backyard. Fire pit! He made a beeline to the pit where the oats had been cooked that morning and used his fingers to rummage in the ashes. Some warmth. They left this morning sometime after dawn, I'd say. Excellent, said Rex. Let's get this finished. I'd like to sleep in my own bed tonight. Many miles away, Jacob was pedaling through a town called Epping on the Caliph Highway. It was a long, straight road, and he was going at a good clip. The sun had climbed high in the sky and had nearly burned off the remains of the morning mist. He thought it was somewhere around ten in the morning. He left the ghost town of Epping behind and within a few minutes reached the turn onto the 101. It was marked by an old McDonald's restaurant. Home stretch, baby! he said, taking a drink from the water bottle he'd refilled from a pond that morning. He took a few extra mouthfuls of the cloudy liquid as a reward. What was left would get him all the way through to Manchester. He got moving again. Jacob cruised on the 101. It was a great road, and he only had to veer around the occasional abandoned vehicle. He avoided looking into them. While he hadn't seen any dead people along the way, he knew it would creep him out if he did. The sixteen-year-old only had the vaguest memories of the before times. He still remembered his mom and dad, though. He thought about them now. He was so lost in thought he wasn't aware of the sound of a motor approaching behind him until it was too late. It wouldn't really have mattered if he had noticed. He was crossing a long overpass and there was nowhere to hide even if he'd had warning. He pulled to a stop and turned to face whoever was coming. Maybe this close to Manchester it was Isaac's people? He left his bow slung over his shoulder, but stayed on his bike. He could see it now. It was a big green truck. There was no doubt they'd seen him. There was a driver and a passenger, their faces white blobs behind the dirty windshield. The truck slowed as it approached. Jacob crossed his arms in a show of confidence that belied his rampaging heartbeat. The truck pulled up fifteen feet away, and just sat there with the motor running for a minute. He could see they were talking. Finally, the passenger side door swung open. A man stepped out. He smiled. He had bad teeth. He also had a gun in his hand. Son, what in hell are you doing out here all on your own? 32. They'd managed to make pretty good time, but Luke was becoming more anxious with each mile. They'd passed Rochester an hour and a half before, and it was already well past midday. As near as he could tell from the map, they were still only halfway to Epping, where they would turn onto the 101. We should let them rest soon, said Diana. Samuel had been complaining of sore feet for the last ten minutes. Luke was about to say no when a half mile ahead he spotted a big tree down on the road, a really big tree. From a distance, the trunk looked at least five feet thick, and it was tall enough that it covered most of both lanes, leaving only a small gap between the bushy top and a large boulder on the verge of the road. How big was the truck the brothers brought when they smashed down your gates? Oh, it's big. A semi-trailer. Isn't that what they called them? Yep. So do you think they'd be able to get it through that gap? Maybe, but it would be a tight squeeze. Luke picked up his pace, a thin smile on his face. I think it would fit, too. Just. Maybe we can fix that and slow them down a little, though. How? Diana asked. I have an idea. We'll rest when we get past the tree. As the people of Willett and Green sat and rested on the south side of the tree, Luke found what he was looking for in an overgrown driveway a hundred yards or so further on. It was an old red two-door Toyota pickup, only its faded tailboard visible under the ivy that had grown over it in the years since it had last been used. I need help, Diana, he called. Bring helpers with you. He pulled ivy away to clear a path down either side of the pickup. It was covered in bird shit and the detritus of the afterdays, 
but it was the most beautiful thing he'd seen that day. He tried the door. It was locked. He smashed the driver's window with his elbow and reached in. The door fought him with rusty might, but finally gave way with a screech. Diana arrived with four helpers. It was Kathy and three of the other mothers. "'Your chariot awaits, madam,' he said to Diana and gestured at the driver's seat with a flourish. "'Idiot!' she laughed, coming down the side. Her nose wrinkled when she peered inside. "'What's the plan?' We're going to push this old beast back to the tree and block that gap, he said. You sit behind the wheel and steer, and the rest of us will push. Luke went to the front and waved for them to join him. You sure we can do this? Kathy asked, putting her hands on the hood next to his. Positive, he said, giving her a grin before giving Diana the thumbs up. Just pull the automatic down to neutral, then take off the handbrake. Thank you, Captain Obvious, she said. Surprisingly, the old beast moved easily, and of course, once they were out of the driveway, the flat road helped. About halfway, they stopped. I'll take over, he said. I want you to push me as hard as you can all the way to the tree. At the last second, I'll turn and go nose first into that rock. I'll yell out when to stop pushing. He unslung his axe and gestured for Samuel to come and get it. Are you sure? Diana asked. Sure, I'll be okay. It won't be fast enough to hurt. Hold that for me, Sammy. I'll need it in a second. Samuel carried the axe back over to the rest of the Willet and Green people, who watched with interest. Luke waved, and the women heaved. The truck started slowly, and a few of the boys came to help. They soon built enough momentum, and it was going pretty fast by the time it got to the gap. Stop pushing! called Luke at the last possible moment and swung the wheel as hard as he could. The Toyota crunched into the rock, its tail swinging fractionally so it was hard against the top branches of the tree. Luke got out and surveyed his handiwork. Not perfect, but it would do with a few finishing touches. Luke punctured both tires on his side with a knife before climbing over the top and doing the same on the passenger side. Pass me my axe, please, Sam. Luke opened the passenger door and pulled the handbrake on as hard as he could, then started hacking at it with the axe, not satisfied until it was completely smashed. The steering wheel followed. "'Do you think it will slow them down?' Diana asked as they started walking again. "'Well,' he said, "'we spent twenty minutes blocking it. If it takes them a half hour to clear it, I reckon that's worth it.'" In the end, Luke's makeshift roadblock held up Christ's chariot by forty minutes. Senior brother Rex took the opportunity to let the men in the trailer out for some fresh air. God knows he used to hate sitting in that sweat box. Brother Simon did his thing, climbing over the barrier and disappearing while Rex and brother Michael looked at the unlikely but effective barrier. Jared, for his part, stayed out of the way. He couldn't help but feeling Rex suspected that he was to blame for Brother Taylor's demise and disappearance. If that was the case, when they returned to their headquarters, things could get very difficult for Jared. "'Could we not just crash through these branches?' asked Rex. A look of incredulity passed fleetingly across Brother Michael's face, replaced quickly by a thoughtful consideration. "'I don't believe so, Brother Rex,' The top of the tree is quite woody and high. We would risk damaging the truck's wheels or axles, maybe even the drivetrain. Rex sniffed. I suppose. What do you suggest, then? Ob um, well, we'll have to move this vehicle, sir, said Michael, patting the hood of the Toyota. Rex's eyes narrowed. All right, get to it. We certainly have enough men. Push it out of the way. It will need to be dragged out of the way, sir, with the truck. Senior Brother Rex looked heavenward. How long? Not sure, sir. Half an hour, maybe? Well, get to it. Michael knew the best idea was to unhook the Mac from the trailer and use chains to drag the pickup out. He also knew Rex wouldn't allow him the extra time that would take. It was still a better idea to pull rather than try and bulldoze the pickup and risk damaging their transportation. He'd just have to do it while the trailer was still attached. 
It took a five-point turn to swing the big rig around, and even though Michael tried to avoid looking at senior brother Rex, he could almost feel the waves of irritation at the delay emanating from the big man. Finally, he backed it up to within a few feet of the Toyota, and with a whoosh of the air brigs jumped out and left the engine running. He helped a few of the men fix chains to the pickup, then to the footrail of the trailer. Back in the cab, Brother Michael put the truck into first, leaning out the window to look back as he slowly pressed the gas. There was a brief screech of metal on rock, then it was free. He dragged the wreck effortlessly along the blacktop and stopped thirty yards down the road. "'Well done, Brother Michael!' yelled Rex as the other brothers clapped and whistled. Happiness washed over the young man. Any praise from senior brother Rex was rare praise indeed. The other men unhooked the chains, and Michael started forward, wrestling the steering wheel of the big rig as he moved it back and forth until he finally had it facing the right direction. Michael hid his disappointment when Rex directed him back into the trailer with the others. He had hoped to drive again, but apparently Simon was still needed up front. Jared closed the roller door on those in back and headed back to the cab, where Rex was already seated firmly in the driver's seat, Brother Simon next to him, his fingers busy running over the map. Well? Rex asked impatiently. I am sure there are only two destinations they can have in mind. They won't just be running blindly, because they'd have to know we'd catch them eventually. I'd say they're most likely heading here. He pointed to the city of Concord. Or here. His finger landed on Manchester. Perhaps the hook-handed man hails from one of these cities? Senior brother Jared snorted. Or anywhere in between? Rex turned his steely gaze on Jared. Do you have a better suggestion, Jared? Jared bristled but held his tongue and shrugged. I think you're right, said Rex, turning the ignition. If they were just looking for somewhere to hide, Rochester would have been as good a place as any. The truck jerked forward. I want to catch them before they have a chance to reach wherever they're going. We don't have the manpower to search a city for them. Branches whipped and scraped along the cab as they squeezed through the gap. How far behind are we? I'd say they passed less than two hours ago, sir, said Brother Simon. Excellent. Rex planted his foot. 33. Luke and the Willetton Green people had passed Epping and were now approaching a tiny McDonald's store. The Big M didn't interest Luke, but the fact that it marked the turn onto the 101 did. They were about to begin the last leg of their journey. Luke, we have to stop. We can't, Luke said and barreled on single-mindedly. Luke, yelled Diana, and stopped in her tracks, pulling down hard on the rope to stop her horse. The tired animal whinnied in protest. The pissed-off mom tone in her voice brought him to heel, and he slowed the horse he was leading to a standstill and turned to her. She looked exhausted. So did everyone else, including the horses. His horse had foam on his flanks, and so did Diana's. Okay, you're right. Sorry, I just... I know. But there is only so long we can go at this pace. We need to let them rest. Luke didn't fight. He had been certain that they would be caught somewhere before Epping, so it was a bonus they had made it this far. As much as he had tried to cover their tracks by picking up the horse droppings as they went, if they had half a brain between them and a keen eye, the Brotherhood would be following their trail. He had no doubt they would be caught somewhere on the 101, and the only question was, had Jacob made it? Was he bringing help? If not, none of it mattered. They wouldn't make it to Manchester. Yes, let's rest. Hopefully we're close enough. They brought the rest of the marchers to a halt in front of the turn-in to the old McDonald's. Diana and Kathy organized the group and rationed out the last of the water and bread they'd brought along. Luke tried to play it cool. He made a half-hearted joke that he'd kill for a Big Mac, but he was anxious, and it showed. He busied himself tending to the horses and entertaining the kids in the carts. Finally, Diana called an end to the rest break. Okay, she called. We need to get moving again. We're nearly there. There were groans all around, but Luke was impressed how quickly the people of Willett and Green 
got themselves up and ready. Alas, it wasn't to be. Just as they were about to move off, Luke heard something. He strained to hear, but the noise of the people milling around him meant he couldn't quite catch it. Shh! Diana's head snapped around. She saw the concern in his eyes. Quiet! she screamed. Silence fell over them. Luke's eyes widened, and he looked back the way they'd come. It wasn't the distant rumbling of a truck. It wasn't the marching of feet. It was music. Like a leaf wafting on the breeze, the faint music waxed and waned, but Luke recognized it immediately. It was sweet and terrible to his ears. Flight of the Valkyrie. Behind him he heard whispers and whimpers of fear. What the holy hell? It's them, said Diana. They play it when they're coming to battle. Just like Apocalypse Now, he said. What? Never mind. They're trying to scare us, but all they did was give us warning they're coming, he said. He pointed down the driveway that led past the McDonald's to the abandoned car dealership that sat behind it. The big white building had large plate glass windows with a sun-faded Toyota symbol on it. Toyota again? Diana, you need to get everyone down into that building. Hide in there and make sure no one makes a noise. I'll stake out the McDonald's. Kathy, you lead my horse, and Sam, you give Mom the shotgun and take her horse. Hurry! If Diana was put out by his abrupt orders, she didn't show it. Kathy grabbed the rope and, with the help of the other mothers in the group, hurried the entire population of Williton Green down the small road towards the dealership building. While it may indeed have given them warning, the threatening music and its ever-increasing volume also did its other job. Luke's heart beat like a jackhammer, and he fought to stay calm. Diana, he called. She stopped and looked back. I should take my gun, he said, removing his axe from its sling as he ran down the narrow road to meet her. He held out the axe. She nodded grimly, tucked the shotgun under her arm, and pulled the pistol out of her belt. As she traded it for the axe, he saw fear, defiance, and something else in her eyes. Something he didn't like. Resignation. He held the gun up. Guns are for insurance only. Hopefully they go right past without a clue that we're here. Just try to keep everyone calm and quiet. He started to turn when she grabbed his wrist and looked at him earnestly. Thanks for everything, he nodded. Thank me after they're gone. He turned and ran for the restaurant in a crouch. He had barely found himself a position in the front of the restaurant under the main window when the flight of the Valkyrie ended, and he heard the rumble of a truck engine. It was drowned out when the music started up again. Jeez, change the song, why don't you? He whispered. 34. Rex turned the music on about twenty minutes after they cleared the roadblock. The road was in surprisingly good condition. There were no more fallen trees, and the only real sign they were traveling in a post-apocalyptic world beside the lack of other vehicles was the encroaching forest on either side of the road. "'Keep your eyes peeled,' said Rex. He didn't need to tell Simon." Like he had been since he'd graduated to a seat in the cab, the younger of the three sat forward in his seat, peering this way and that with the utmost concentration. Jared, bored stupid, pondered the silliness of that phrase, keep your eyes peeled. Frankly, he didn't expect one would see a lot with peeled eyes. Not long after, the Caliph Highway transformed as homes, then buildings, became more frequent. Epping was a name that started appearing on signs, Jared glanced down at the map on Brother Simon's lap. Okay, we've reached Epping. The next turn is the 101. They surely can't have got too much further, said Simon. Senior Brother Rex slowed the vehicle a little. Very good. Two minutes later, Simon pointed into the distance. Look, there's the turn, right after that McDonald's. To his surprise, Senior Brother Rex brought the big vehicle to a halt. Jared and Simon looked at him expectantly. He didn't say anything, just left the motor running and climbed out. Where's he going? asked Simon. Isn't it obvious? He's letting the gunman out.
Luke ducked a little lower when the truck finally came into view. It was traveling slow, barely a few miles an hour, right down the center of the two lanes. He could see three men in the cab, but couldn't make out their features. The music echoed around the parking lot as he watched them almost inch their way towards the McDonald's. It was excruciating. He put the pistol on the dusty floor and wiped his sweaty hand down his thigh before picking it up again. If all went well, they would cruise right past, and he wouldn't need to use it. The Willet and Green people were safely hidden, and he didn't intend on drawing any attention to himself. That was when he spotted the four men carrying rifles, walking behind the semi-trailer. Crap. They were dressed in the same monk habits as the brothers he'd seen before, just with rifles instead of staffs. Luke willed himself to stay calm. This development didn't change anything. He'd known all along they would come with guns. Diana had been certain of it. But seeing four men carrying was a lot different to imagining it. Still, as long as they kept going, everything would work out. Luke didn't realize he was holding his breath until his lungs began to burn. He slowly exhaled as the big rig passed the driveway and kept rolling along, the men behind it scanning the area around them. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. The truck stopped. 35. Luke, his hand trembling, watched as the doors of the truck opened. A stout man in a black habit jumped lightly from the driver's side. Luke recognized the first one out of the passenger side immediately. Jared, Tommy's killer. A younger man with sandy hair got out behind him. He almost pushed Jared out of the way in his enthusiasm to get to the driveway. For a second, Luke wondered what he was doing as he walked in a wide circle, pointing at the road and mumbling to himself. He stopped at the mouth of the driveway and pointed down the driveway at a pile of horse droppings. Luke muttered an expletive. In the rush, he hadn't noticed. He didn't waste any time watching what happened next. They were made. What was important now was that he got back to the others. He tucked the gun into his belt and crawled his way from the window to the back of the restaurant. He risked a glance back through to the front window and made sure he wasn't in their line of sight before jumping the counter and running through the kitchen. At the back door, he paused before sprinting in a crouch towards the left corner of the Toyota building. He was careful to keep the restaurant between him and the Brotherhood as he jumped the small rail fence and dashed between used cars towards the smaller of the glass doors. He couldn't see any movement behind the windows. Thankfully, the door was open. He stepped through. There was a movement to his right, and he jerked around to find himself staring down the twin barrels of a shotgun. Diana was pointing it at him over the top of a partition. It's me, he said needlessly. She was already lowering the gun. Where is everyone? In the service center out back. I take it they didn't go past. No, they're coming. I didn't stick around to see how many, but there are at least four carrying automatic weapons. Her eyes grew distant. So, this is it, then? He nodded. Afraid so. Well, let's give him something to remember us by. Yep. He pointed to the other side of the building. They'll probably come in those doors. You stay there and pop up just like you did with me. I'll get behind that red scion there. Wait till a few are through the door. Then we'll see what we see. Diana ducked back down and he rushed to the dusty blue Toyota Scion in the middle of the floor. He hunkered down at its rear. No matter which way they came in, he would have a good line of sight. He didn't have long to wait. It's fresh, called Brother Simon, squatting next to the horse shit. Let's get the others out, Jared, said Rex, a tremor of excitement in his voice. He waved the four gunmen to him. You want to leave the truck out here? Yes, no more questions. Do it now, Rex said, walking down the driveway to watch the building in the distance. Jared burned with anger, but he managed to manufacture a curt nod before walking purposefully to the rear of the truck and pulled the door open. We have them cornered, Jared said, as the men blinking in the daylight began to pile out. 
Go to Brother Rex. As they were jumping out, Jared disappeared around the corner of the trailer, headed for the cab. Senior Brother Rex was watching intently as the gunmen split into two pairs and moved towards the building. They stayed low and looked all business. He turned as the sixteen arrived, their hickory staffs in hand. Where is Brother Jared? he asked. Just closing the tailgate, sir. Here he comes now, said a man at the back. Jared ran up to them, his staff in hand. Sorry, had to get my staff. His cheeks were flushed. Rex paid it no mind. They were all excited to finally bring this chase to its bloody end. He addressed the men. Follow the men. Be ready for anything. Leave none alive except the big redhead. Yes, sir. They called in unison and sprinted after the gunman. Come, Jared, said Senior Brother Rex, setting off at a more leisurely pace. There's something I wish to discuss with you. Jared fell in beside him. His free hand slipped into the big, roughly sewn pocket of his habit. They looked ahead as their men cautiously approached the building that housed the car showroom. What is it, Rex? If the use of his name without the honorific disturbed him, Senior Brother Rex did not show it. Well, I'll come right out and say it. Brother Simon informed me that two brothers left Willet and Green that day. Really? Well, he has been known to be wrong. That would explain Brother Taylor's missing body, though, wouldn't it? Jared stopped. Are you accusing me of something? Rex paused and turned to face him. Yes, I am. I don't know exactly what it is I'm accusing you of yet, but I'm sure with Brother Simon's help I can get to the bottom of it. He was interrupted by the abrupt popping of gunfire from the car dealership. He glanced in that direction and then turned back to find himself looking down the barrel of a snub-nosed revolver. Jared had broken into the glove compartment of the truck and taken it. The weapon was secreted in there in case of emergencies, and to Jared, the threat of Rex spilling his guts to the council was an emergency. No need for all that work, said Jared. I confess, Rex, I killed Brother Taylor. Rex didn't look shocked. In fact, a self-satisfied smile curled his lips. He nodded. The bastard is happy he's right. Why the fuck isn't he scared? You don't need to say anything, Rex, he said, hating the whine in his voice. He shook the gun at the bigger man. The knowledge won't do you any good because now I'm going to kill you, too. Rex's face was that of a teacher dealing with an errant child. He was confident and in control. Jared was a cocky but ultimately powerless annoyance, and Rex knew he had him. Really? And how will you explain that away? I won't need to, you smug asshole. Rex's smile dropped away and he began to raise his staff. The shot took him in the forehead. The loud report lost amidst the gun battle behind them. Rex collapsed to the ground, his staff falling from lifeless fingers. Amen, said Jared. He put the revolver back in his pocket before stepping over his victim's body and running for the car yard. 36. Diana fired the first shot. It was ear-ringing loud. She hit the first guy through the door in the throat and he fell in a cloud of crimson. There were screams of, Get back! It took all of 20 seconds for the response. The plate glass windows exploded in a storm of hot metal. Luke fell to the cold, sealed cement floor and held the pistol tight. Bullets hammered into the car in front of him and the walls behind him. Shattered auto glass fell over him like a soft hail. Twenty feet away, he could see Diana's feet under the partition. For a second, he thought she might be dead. Then she squirmed, and the toe of her sneaker made a squeak that he somehow heard over the din. The barrage continued for around forty seconds, then stopped. Luke thought about moving them, had visions of running out Rambo-style with his pistol. Then sense prevailed. Better to wait for them. If the four men behind the truck were the only ones armed with guns, the odds were now significantly better than they had been. 
three to two instead of four to two. He turned his gaze from Diana and swung his long body around to look at the glassless doors and windows to his left. He couldn't see any movement but knew it wouldn't be long. Keeping his belly against the floor, he crawled out from behind the car using his elbows for propulsion and began to slither to the front. He had made about five feet of the fifteen when a face appeared at the jagged edge of the window, then ducked out of sight quickly. Oh, shit. He'd been made. Luke rolled to his right as the gunman reappeared, his bullets cratering the concrete where Luke had lain a second before. Luke felt a hot slice of pain across his thigh and began firing. The one-handed shooting wasn't pretty. In fact, it was ugly. But he got lucky. The gunman had slipped back out of sight, but Luke's third shot hit the drywall beside the window. It pierced the wall, striking the brother in the back. Luke heard his groan and the clatter of the falling gun. Two to two. Boom! There was no scream to accompany Diana's second shot, but lots more returned fire. While the remaining gunmen were concentrating their fire on her window, Luke took the opportunity to crawl the rest of the way to the front wall and slowly stood until his face was level with the hole his bullet had made. He judged a quick look through the hole was worth the risk to see how things stood outside. The quick glance didn't tell him much at all. He couldn't see anyone and assumed the enemy had taken cover behind the used cars in the lot. He caught movement to his right and jerked around. It was Diana. She crawled to him, staying below the sill of the window, then stood up when she reached him. He motioned her to duck down with him. He didn't want a stray bullet to end their last stand. Did you see anything? She asked. Luke opened his mouth to answer but didn't get the chance. You may as well come out. Luke didn't recognize the voice, but from the look on her face, he knew Diana did. She shook her head furiously as if he might actually consider the request. You can't fight your way out, Jared continued. There are too many of us. If you come out now, I'll spare the children. We'll take them back with us, and they'll live long, happy lives. Fuck you, Jared, screamed Diana. Luke cringed and waited for another hail of bullets. Instead, he heard low, calm voices. That was somehow worse. His worried gaze met Diana's. Mama? Diana clapped her hand over her mouth, her eyes filling with tears. You have ten seconds to come out with your hands up. After ten, we start killing the children. Starting with, what's your name, son? Good boy. Starting with Samuel. Diana closed her eyes and hugged the shotgun to her as she slid the rest of the way down the wall, finally defeated. Luke shook his head. They were done. As sure as he was that Jared was lying, he couldn't take the chance that the bastard wouldn't show some mercy. He sure as hell couldn't let the kid die any more than his mother could. Come on, he said gently as he rose to his feet. She wiped the tears from her eyes with the heel of her hand and nodded, accepting his hand. Luke pulled her to her feet and asked if she was ready. She nodded again. We're coming out, Luke called. They stepped into the open window with their hands up, weapons in the air. He half expected they would be shot as soon as they appeared, but it seemed this Jared had a flair for the dramatic. Ah, that's the way, he said. Now slowly put the weapons down and come on out. They put the weapons on the floor and stepped over the low window sill onto the pavement. See, son, I told you everything would be okay, Jared said, putting his hand on Samuel's shoulder. Diana tensed but didn't move. One of the last two gunmen stood on the other side of Samuel. The muzzle of his gun pointed at the boy's ear. The rest of Diana's group were in a huddle, on their knees with their hands on their heads. The other gunman stood over them. One look in Brother Jared's eyes told him how this would go down. The rest of the brothers stood silently, sentinels watching what Luke knew now would be a bloody massacre. Tears of helpless rage blurred his vision. Not for him, but for these poor kids and their mothers. Ah, look! 
the big man is crying, said Jared, an ugly look on his face. It was then, over the bastard's shoulder, Luke noticed the black-robed body in the distance. What happened? Did you have a falling out with your friend? Jared's face displayed annoyance. His men turned to look at the body of senior brother Rex. One of your bullets killed brother Rex, God bless his soul, and you'll pay dearly for it. Hmm, that's quite a distance. I didn't think I was that good a shot, especially one-handed. He held up his hook for illustration. With a pistol. Enough, Jared yelled, not quite managing to keep the strident tone from his voice. The men of the Brotherhood began to look at each other, and Jared knew he needed to get the situation under control quickly. Luke wasn't done, though. Just the way you can't avoid prodding a sore tooth with your tongue, he couldn't let this go. No, I think you and the big guy had a falling out. Shut up! screamed Jared. Is this true, senior brother Jared? asked one of the younger men. Luke recognized him as the one who had discovered their hiding place. Of course not, you idiot. Can't you see what he's trying to do? He turned to the man with his gun trained on Samuel. Shoot the boy! No, please don't! called Diana, shrugging off Luke's arm and running over to her son. Too late, Jared said, looking at Luke triumphantly. Shoot the boy, then his mother. The man put the muzzle of his gun against the boy's temple. Jared stepped back. Diana, sobbing, hugged Samuel to her. Luke, unable to stand by and just watch them be slaughtered, charged at them. He had barely taken two steps when the gunman's left shoulder exploded. The distant crack of a gunshot followed a split second later. The force of the sniper's shot spun the gunman around even as he pulled the trigger. Jared ducked and fell to the ground. The three brothers behind him weren't so quick, and the automatic gunfire from their own man cut them down as he fell. Luke stayed down after the gun went silent, but looked around to try and locate the last brother with an automatic weapon. He found him quickly. The panicked man was behind the Willet and Green people, and looked around frantically before firing in a fanning pattern in the direction of the on-ramp to the 101. The sniper's neck shot struck the man in the chest and picked him up off his feet, flinging him like a rag doll into the used Chevy behind him. His ruined back left a snail trail of blood on the silver paintwork as he slipped onto the concrete. Everyone stay down, yelled Luke. It seemed to be friendly fire, but they were still in danger of stray bullets. More shots, more of the brothers went down. Finally, the last few, guided by the one called Simon, dropped their staffs and fell to their knees with their hands up. People were screaming. Confusion reigned. Luke looked across to where Diana had been hugging Samuel to her. The boy was cowering on the ground, his hands over his ears, but he was okay. Diana was gone. So was Jared. 37. Luke stood up. A bullet whizzed by his ear and took down a brother that he hadn't seen peeking from behind the corner of the building. He barely registered the near miss. Beyond the used cars and moving along the driveway beside the McDonald's was Jared and Diana. He was shuffling backwards, Diana held against his chest with one arm and his free hand holding a revolver hard under her chin. Luke limped after them as armed men in faded U.S. Army fatigues began to appear from the long brush between the Toyota lot and the on-ramp to the 101. Everyone down on the ground, someone ordered. Luke ignored them and kept running. His thigh burned like hell, but he only stopped when, as he drew near, Jared jammed the gun even harder into Diana's chin. Not another step, you fucker. Luke held up his arms. Okay, okay, I'm not armed. Just let her go. Please. Oh, sure, since you asked so sweetly. He turned the gun on Luke and smiled crazily. Nice knowing you, asshole. Diana smacked his hand away and the shot went wild. Jared still had a grip on her until she kicked backwards hard like a mule between his legs. It wasn't a completely accurate blow, but strong enough that he doubled over. She slipped out of his grip and ran towards Luke. Luke ran to meet her, his arms open. Jared's shot was like a starter's gun going off. Diana stumbled forward, a look of agony painted across her face. Luke caught her, and they fell to the ground. 
There was a gunshot behind them, and Jared, already running away, jerked as a bullet struck him in the upper arm. It almost knocked him off balance. Almost. He changed direction ninety degrees and plunged into the thick brush that lined the other side of the driveway. Luke held Diana. He shot me, she said in a calm voice. You'll be okay, said Luke, his voice thick. How's your leg? He glanced at his blood-stained thigh. Well, that's a lot of blood. It pooled in the wound and dripped down onto the concrete. He looked down at her pale face. It's okay. I don't know if I believe you. You look awful pale. So do you. Suddenly there were people around them. Stretcher, someone close by called. Make that two. Motes swam in Luke's eyes as someone knelt beside him. A familiar face filled his vision. Hey, buddy, said Isaac, as his eyes filled with tears. Good to see you. Isaac, Luke said, smiling and squeezing the warm hand that had found his. Why are you crying? It's only a leg wound. He saw his friend's mouth working. The only word he heard was happy. Then someone turned out the lights. 38. Jared stopped running after about two miles. He collapsed to the ground, his chest heaving. His bleeding arm stung cruelly, and he pulled the sleeve of his habit up to reveal the bullet wound. It had gone right through the fleshy part of his forearm, miraculously missing bone, but bleeding quite heavily. He looked back the way he had come. They didn't appear to be following any more. God be praised. He slipped into an abandoned gas station and headed to the back, scanning the almost bare shelves as he went looking for something he could use as a bandage. After a short search, he found a clear plastic pack of handkerchiefs on the floor. It would have to do. Ten minutes later, he was walking again, a plastic bottle of green-tinged water from the toilet of the gas station in his pocket next to the revolver. He walked and passed the time by formulating his story. He would return a hero and put this whole sordid mess behind him. He did worry that there might be survivors amongst his comrades, but surely none of them would be allowed to return home. The question of who the armed interlopers were could wait until he was safely home. The bumps and noise of an engine woke Luke. He opened his eyes. He was on his back in the open tray of a vehicle. Soft white clouds were scattered here and there on the sky overhead, like fluffy sheep on a brilliant field of blue. He felt a little disoriented. He's awake, said someone. He started to sit up, and a hand against his chest pushed him back down gently. Don't try to sit up just yet, said Isaac, putting a water bottle to his lips. They patched you up and gave you some morphine for the pain. You might feel a little bit out of it. He nodded and swallowed some water. It was cool and fresh. Diana? The doc says she's going to be okay. She's in the other truck. She was shot in the back, above the kidney, but he thinks it missed all her major organs. He's going to take the bullet out when we get back to Concord. She'll be sick and sorry for a while, though. Did you get him? Isaac knew who Luke meant. He shook his head. No, he said over the noise of the engine. They looked for twenty minutes, but then Bowman called it. Randall's orders were clear, extraction only. Luke, hiding his disappointment, nodded. So Jacob found you. Is he okay? He's fine. He didn't find us. One of the colonel's patrols found him and sent for me. Looks like we made it in the nick of time. You did. Luke's eyes were heavy from the morphine, and he closed his eyes again. When he awoke next, he was being carried on a stretcher up the path towards the steps that led into Randall's headquarters. He tilted his head up. Isaac was holding that end of the stretcher, a sheen of sweat on his brow. Dude, I think I can walk, 
set me down. No, it's okay. It's just a little way now. Luke took the decision out of his hands and swung his legs over the side of the stretcher, almost falling out as Isaac and his partner tried to ride it. Fine, fine, hang on. Luke maintained a crooked smile as he put his feet down, even as his legs shrieked in protest. Isaac and the soldier lowered the stretcher as he stood upright. He allowed Isaac to put a shoulder under his arm and help him walk up the steps. The soldier folded up the canvas stretcher and followed them. I did that for you, you know, he said to Isaac. Oh, really? Yeah, you look like you were going to drop your end at any second. Gee, I've missed you, Isaac said, smiling playfully as they lumbered up the steps. Why are we here? They've got better medical facilities than us. Your friend Diana has already gone in. They left men to watch over the rest of the people you brought, and trucks are already on the way to bring them in. We'll go home to Manchester tomorrow. If you want to, that is. Luke looked at his friend. I do, man. Randall and Bowman were waiting at the top of the steps. They greeted Luke, Randall patting him on the shoulder. Good to see you're still in one piece, son. Thanks to you guys, said Luke, nodding at Bowman. They stepped across the threshold, and as his eyes adjusted to the light inside the building, he spied two more familiar faces. Before he could even say hello, a teary-eyed indigo rushed forward, almost knocking him down as she gripped him in a bear hug. He hugged her back, and looking over her shoulder, his gaze fell on Ben. His English friend was behind Indigo, and he was walking slowly towards them, a small package in his arms. He also had tears streaming down his face. Luke was about to tease him when he realized it wasn't a package. It was a bundle. A squirming bundle in a pink blanket. Indigo slipped out of his arms, now crying in earnest. Luke sobbed as realization crashed down on him. He shook his head. Ben nodded. Another sob racked Luke, and he fell to his knees, looking skyward. No, he whispered. Ben stopped in front of him. Yes, he said softly, and held out the bundle to his friend. Luke lowered his gaze to the opening in the top of the blanket. The most beautiful pair of blue eyes looked up curiously at him. Luke, meet your daughter, Erin, Ben said, his voice cracking with emotion. Weeping softly, Luke put out his arms uncertainly as Ben lowered his baby daughter into them. She was perfect, perfect features, perfect complexion, perfect soft, downy hair. He cuddled her to him as Isaac and Indigo joined Ben in front of him. She's beautiful, just like Brooke, said Luke, laughing and crying as tears of joy spilled over his cheeks. They cried and laughed with him. Somehow, after feeling so wrong for so long, everything felt right again. 39. Jared crossed back into Maine two days after the battle at the junction. He was hungry and tired, but in good shape considering the skin around the wound on his arm was pink and inflamed. He'd be home in another four hours or so. As he walked along the leaf-covered road, the forest thick around and overhead, he allowed himself to think about how he would persuade the council to allow him to take a force a much bigger force to find the handless criminal and bring him back alive to face his crucifixion. He smiled a thin, mirthless smile. If the woman Diana wasn't dead already, he thought he might just cut her to pieces and feed her to the bastard before bringing him back. Jared didn't see the animal resting in the leaves by the side of the road until he was only a few feet away. Its tawny fur was almost perfect camouflage in that light, and against the golden carpet of maple leaves. He stopped. 
It took a few seconds for his brain to process what he was seeing. Then fear kicked in. Barely daring to breathe, he slowly lowered his hand towards the pocket of his habit. The lion stood. Nice kitty cat, he said as his fingers closed over the revolver. The lion took an uncertain step towards him and sniffed the air. Jared took a step back. The lion took another forward. Jared made his final mistake. He turned and ran, trying to pull the revolver out as he went. It was tangled in the material, and he finally pulled it free with a yell of triumph. Then the freight train hit him. Claws, teeth ripping, shredding. Death. Epilogue Rochester, New York The tall, blonde man with the crooked nose watched silently through the one-way glass. The naked man, strapped to the chair in the adjoining room, gargled in pain as the interrogator pulled another tooth from his jaw with a vicious wrench of his arm. Where are you from? he screamed into the moaning man's face. The man in the chair closed his eyes and shook his head, the blood from his mouth dribbling down his chin and onto his chest. He had been captured the day before. The other three in his company had been killed, one woman and two men. They had been well-armed, wearing U.S. Army fatigues and in possession of a working jeep. A platoon had stumbled upon them while driving back from a freshly captured settlement in Albany, near to the border with Massachusetts and New Hampshire. In the ensuing fight, the interlopers had killed two of his soldiers and wounded three others before they were put down. Worryingly, they had been well within the borders, in fact only fifteen miles out from Rochester. The blond man lost patience. He stalked to the microphone and grabbed it. Enough with the gentle stuff. Get it done. The interrogator looked at the mirror glass. Yes, sir. He dropped the tooth on the floor and stepped up to the chair with his pliers open. The man in the chair's eyes opened again when he felt the cold jaws of the pliers close on one of his testicles. Please, no. The interrogator's arm tensed as he squeezed. The man screamed. Where are you from? I'll tell you. Please, stop. The jaws of the pliers opened slightly, and the man slumped in his chair. Where? Concord, in New Hampshire, he said in a shuddering, exhausted voice. How many of you are there? The man shook his head again, tears and sweat streaming down his face. The pliers squeezed harder this time. He screamed louder. I'll tell you everything! Stop! Last warning. The next time you refuse me, I'll pop it like a grape. Understand? How many? An exhausted nod. Roughly five hundred. Ten minutes later, they had all the information they were going to get. It was enough. The group in Concord were large and well-equipped and had military personnel amongst them. That, and the fact they had sent a team to gather intel on them, meant they were a real and immediate threat. The blonde man, whose name was William, and who had once helped trap unsuspecting survivors for the Chinese, spoke into the mic again. Kill him. He lingered to watch the coup de grace, a thoughtful look on his face, then headed for the door. It was time to speak to the president.